Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah, there in your Old Testament. If you're having a hard time finding it, you can just find Psalms back up a few blocks and you'll find Nehemiah in between Ezra and Esther. If you're still having a hard time, just go to your cheat sheet over there in the uh, table of contents. Check it out. They put it all in there for you. And uh, so you can use that, and it is very, very useful. No shame in doing that. I used to do that a lot of times. Still do sometimes when John will say, hey, uh, let's go over here to this little minor prophet. And it's only about two pages, so you've got to try to shuffle through there and try to find it. So Nehemiah chapter 9, we're going to read verse 16 and 17 here in a minute, and then look at some other verses uh, as well as we continue to look at rebuilding the wall of confession. So let me welcome our online crowd. We appreciate you tuning in from wherever you are around the world. And so just tell us where you're watching us from. Uh, if you're new, just tell us that. We're not going to bug you. We're not going to send nothing to you, email you nothing. Just want to say hello. That's all we want to do. And so uh, good to have them on here. And I've said it before. If you had told the Apostle Paul, hey, just stand right here. We're going to put this camera in your face. and It's going to go all over the world. Uh, he just said, sure, I don't have to write these letters and, and then send them and take forever to get there. Uh, he would have loved to have the technology we have today. And as we already heard, uh, we have a couple here visiting us today because they found us on Google. So how about that? And so people do find us. I, I, there's a lot of weird things going on on my business page on Facebook. I'm getting a lot of people from India tuning in. So either they love dogs over in India or something's going on. I don't know what they're doing over there. And uh, so just uh, it's amazing how social media can shrink the world. And it really is a good thing, and we can impact them. So online, uh, get your Bibles open up as well. The good news is, you don't have to be in a church building. God can speak to you right there, even around the world. And some of these guys have already been to church, Bob. So their pastor's on here from Africa, and they've already been to church. And now it's nighttime over there, so they're hanging out with us, and they're pulling double duty. So we, uh, we welcome you, Stanley, and all your buddies there. We, we appreciate you guys tuning in. So Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. And let's pick up on part 2, part 3 now, uh, of this subject, Rebuilding the wall of confession. So remember, we're looking at Nehemiah, and Nehemiah was building a physical wall around Jerusalem there. We were looking at Haggai in our life group this morning. He's building a, a temple, but Nehemiah was building a wall. And so God's not calling us to build a wall around Jerusalem right now. So what does he want us to do? We're looking at some spiritual implications. Uh, so all these different subjects, we talked about prayer and faith and unity and service and instruction and all that stuff. And now we're looking at rebuilding the wall, the spiritual wall of confession. And we're looking at how they come together. And they had a six-hour service, and they're really just confessing to God and speaking into, into uh, uh, Ezra, speaking into the life of the people there. And then as they hear the word that naturally brought a response from them. And I told you that everybody always responds to every single message. There's no neutrality with God. Either we obey Him or we disobey Him. But Jesus said you cannot be neutral. Either you're for me or you're against me. Either gathering and doing what you can to build the kingdom or you're scattering. So there's no neutrality with God. So when my preacher buddies ask me, hey, anybody respond to the message? Everybody responded to the message. And they're going to say the same thing to me. Everybody responded to the message. Online, on campus, same thing. And so we're rebuilding these spiritual walls and we're asking God to speak into our lives and say, God, where do I need to draw closer to you? Yes. And uh, so we're looking at all of that. And remember the first uh, half of the book was really dedicated to the physical wall building, but now he's starting to deal with the people. So it's one thing to build a wall, that's a piece of cake. Building a wall, building people takes a lot more work. So the last half of the book is really dealing with him trying to get these people on the right page, and part of it was confessing the sins they had in their life. So we'll pick up on part three of that subject. So Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. Let's stand together all over the building. And there at home, when your Bible's opened up, as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. Now you have it in front of you, either in paper form, or you got it on your phone or tablet. You got it at home, hopefully. If not, it's up on the screen for you. Nehemiah chapter 9 We'll just read verse 16 and 17 for now. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed the leader to return them to the slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful 
that you indeed are a God of compassion and mercy and grace. And Father, we must not forget that you are also a holy God and a righteous God. You despise sin. So Lord, we ask that you would help us today to take examples from the Jews back in Nehemiah's day as they confessed their sins and got right with you, repented. Or would you help us to do the same thing today? And Father, would you allow us to receive your mercy and your grace that we do not deserve and we can never earn or repay you for. And Father, maybe there's somebody who's hearing my voice either here in this room or watching us from around the world online. It may be that they have yet to repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray that today will be the day they will get saved. Father, is anybody hearing my voice that is walking at a guilty distance? Would you bring them back home? Is anybody with a burden on their heart? Would you help them to lay it down at the foot of the cross? Father, would you speak? Would you help us to obey? Well, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, we began to look over the last couple of weeks, as you see in your bulletin there, that uh, the people there, they stood and confessed. As I mentioned, they had three hours of preaching, three hours of an altar call, and the people really, really got right with God, and God moved mightily that day in that service. And then they, they, had, uh, they, they started to uh, remember their history with God. They walked through the history. They started talking about it. We looked at it last week, how God called Abram, who would later change his name to Abraham, out of a pagan culture and pagan family, pagan city. And he wanted to do a good work with him. And he started what is known as Israel, the, the Jewish nation. And so then they started looking at all of that and how God was moving in their lives. But then, on top of that, he now comes to verse 16, where there's a transition into him talking about what God had been doing and uh, moving in Abraham's life and Moses and the other things that he mentioned there in uh, the last couple of weeks. And then now he's going to talk to us about, they don't only remember their history, but they remember their hardness toward God. So the people, they had become hardened toward God, and they were reflecting upon that as they stood and they confessed. So notice the magnitude of their corruption. So as Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites are all spending time talking and praying to God and speaking into the life of the people there, they speak about the magnitude of their own corruption. So the Levites led, by, led the people to humble themselves and confess their hardness in their rebellion towards God. And we talked about how nobody can get right with God unless they humble themselves. If you're bragging about how good you are, you're never going to get right with God. Not in the context of salvation, not in the context of sanctification. So Israel, uh, as often as the case, thought there was something special. And in their arrogance, they sinned against the holy God. And they did this on a repeated basis. And you see that all throughout the book of Judges where they would uh, rebel against God. They start worshiping false gods. They start mingling with, with other marriages. And they just would rebel and not do what they're supposed to be doing. And then God would punish them with one nation after another. Then they repent. And God says, I feel compassion for you. He would send a judge in there, get them under control, and, and uh, give them some freedom back again. They would do good for a little while. Then they fall right back into the same old routine. This was an ongoing process in their history and we do stand with Israel today and pray for them, but they still need to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. And so they need to recognize that Jesus is the only hope of getting in. And so as they were uh, talking about this and confessing this, they now start to recognize that, hey, God, we didn't do so good, and our fathers didn't do so good either. So now Joshua, he also challenged the people that they need to turn from their sins. And they need to repent in Joshua 24. Isaiah also confessed. You saw the verse up there uh, in, 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 uh, a minute ago before the, one of the songs. Uh, the angels crying out to uh, uh, God, holy, holy, holy. There in Isaiah chapter 6. There's a worship service that Isaiah has stumbled into. But G God, Isaiah, when he saw the angels worshiping God, then he turned around and said that I am a man of unclean lips. So he recognized that he was a sinner living in a sinful nation in Isaiah 6, 5. So America has done no better than the Israelites. We are full of arrogance and pride. Uh, we have hardened our hearts toward God. We boast of being the greatest nation in the world. And we falsely believe that because of our military might and our great riches, that's what makes us great. But we forget that God is the one who decides uh, what we really are. And so godliness is what makes a nation great. Not military might and not great riches. So although there is always a faithful remnant, this nation has turned its back on God. Uh, too many in the church 
they think and they talk and they act just like the world. And then we wonder why we're out there witnessing and trying to get our friends to come to church and saying, you guys don't act a whole lot different than we do. Uh, and I've seen some really, really disturbing stuff at a men's conference uh, that I saw some videos online. Very disturbing and very ungodly uh, what's going on in some of what we call Christianity. And if the Apostle Paul was to come back today, he'd say, this is what you guys call Christianity? It is foreign to us. We have no knowledge of what you're talking about. If other people came from other countries and they would come here in America, they'd say, this is what you call Christianity? Certainly different than what we have over there. And we are too arrogant and too prideful and we think and talk and act just like the world. So look what he said there in verse 16. So as they're confessing and they're talking to God, this is all part of their worship service, in verse 16 he says, but they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. And this is the Levites talking to God. They're praying and, 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 and having a confession time. It says they became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. So after you just talked about how great God was, how he had started the nation there with Abraham, and then how he got them out of the mess they were in in Egypt, and how he did the great miracles there with the ten plagues, and then get them through the Red Sea, and how he took care of them out there in the desert. He just talked about all of that. He said, but yet God, in spite of all your goodness to us, here's what we did. We acted arrogantly and became stubborn. And now that uh, the King James used the word prideful. Uh, pride is a terrible sin and is the root of all other sin. It was pride that caused Satan to think that he could overthrow God and he got, got himself and a third of the angels kicked out of heaven. It was pride that caused Adam and Eve to go ahead and take a bite of the fruit when God told them not to do that. And they thought they could become like God because they fell for Satan's lies. Pride makes us think less of God and his word and less of others and too much of ourselves. Now, if you want to know if you struggle with pride, think about how you feel when you don't get your way. How do you feel when you feel like somebody else got something that you deserved? Here's a good test. How do you feel when somebody disrespects you? If your first response is, well, I'll fix them. They're going to find out who they're talking to. Then you're full of pride. That's why. Yeah. You think too much of yourself. And I like what Spurgeon said. When others think ill of you, do not feel bad because you are worse than they think you're to be. <laughs> if they only knew the true us, they would say, good night, I got a lot more ammunition now. Listen to what Paul said about, about it, how we should act in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Uh, don't, don't feel all puffed up. And, and don't do it because you benefit from that. See, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. So said, you got to think right in order to act right. So when you think humble, then you're going to act humble. But if you think arrogant and puffed up and prideful, uh, that's the problem. So then he would go on to say, let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about by this. And then in verses 5 through 11, he would describe how Jesus came down to earth uh, in, in a lowly human body to a nobody family out in the middle of nowhere, and then he would eventually go to the cross and die in our place. He says, this is what I'm talking about when I say, think more of others than yourself. So Jesus said, I am God in the flesh, and I should be worshipped, but I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to do it because you guys got no hope of getting in if I don't come and save you. And so it really is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an Instagram reel out there. We were going to put it out there today, but we put out a different one with Bob driving, and he was weaving in and out of traffic talking about how he was late for church. So we put that one out there, Bob. See how that one does. We'll hold the other one over till next Sunday. But the, the caption over it, it says, Do you think you can hurt my feelings? I sing songs that say worse about me than what you could say. Yes. And then our first song that we listed there was Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch That's right. like me. That's right. So when I know what the songs say about me, when I know what the Bible says about me, I'm not really worried about what anybody else says about me. I say, good, if you only knew as much about me as God knew, you'd have said worse about me. So we'll see how much that gets people's attention. And so when really you're, you're puffed up with pride, then you're starting to worry about what other people think about you. We need more humility, especially among born-again Christians. You don't have to respond to every single uh, comment that people put on your post. You don't have to respond to every single word that somebody says about you. You say, God knows. And, and by the way, if they lie about you, you say, well, that's a, that's a, a bald-faced lie. I never said that. Well, they lied about Jesus. You're in pretty good company. So just be thankful that they are uh, talking about you. 
and leaving somebody else alone. So, so nobody can come to God and be saved unless they're humble. And so that's why we always start out our evangelism asking the question, would you consider yourself to be a good person? And as soon as they say, yes, I would, then that immediately tells us they have pride because the Bible says there's none good, not even one. Right. And so we've got to get them to understand that they've got to be humble before they come to God. So it's not like God needs us and he just somehow is so blessed and grateful to have us. And we need him. And then you hear that a lot of times at a funeral. Well, heaven's a little bit better now that grandma's up there. Heaven was perfect without grandma. <laughs> if Jesus is there, that's all we need. That's right. Amen. And so Janita put out the verse today that I read in my quiet time a few days ago uh, out of Psalm 73. Well, who have I in heaven but you? That's right. uh, really, why are we going to heaven? We're going there because of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so he doesn't need... Uh, any of us can make heaven better. It's perfect the way it is. We're blessed to be up there. And nobody can get saved unless they're humble. But listen to me now. Nobody can walk with God unless they stay humble. Uh, the disciples, sometimes they argued among themselves, who was the greatest? And Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the least. They got another little video I've seen out there where the guy is in the front of the line. There's a door here. And, and then they're all yelling at him. They tell him to get back here. And they, I don't know if he cut in line or what the, what the situation is, but they all tell him to get back here. So then they put him way in the back of the line. Then all of a sudden, the guy comes out the other door. He's the first one in line. And somebody put that verse out there that if you want to be first, you've got to be last. That's right. Yeah. God help us to be humble. And I cannot walk with God if I'm full of pride and arrogance. won't work that way. Well, listen to Israel's confession as they uh, talk to God about their, how they kept on messing up. Then we'll look at the good news of how God kept on blessing them and encouraging them. But notice what it says there in verse 16. It says, but they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. So they knew what the Bible said. They just didn't want to obey the Bible. And how many times do you have people say to you today, when you say what the Bible says? Well, I, I don't care what that book says. Uh, well, that's outdated. That's just Paul's opinion. I, I don't care what Paul said. Uh, and so they just say it's outdated. So they won't listen to God's commands. They know what the Word says. They just don't want to listen to it. Now, it's one thing for the pagans out there to say, I, I don't believe in that book, a bunch of fairy tales written by a bunch of guys a long time ago. But it's another thing to say, I'm a born-again Christian, and yet I don't believe the Bible. Uh, I saw another video where a girl was, was trying to convince somebody else she was a Christian and then he said, but everything you're doing goes against the Bible. He said, oh, I, I, I don't read my Bible. I don't believe my Bible anyway. So you just want to believe John 3, 16, that God loved you and he died for you, but you don't want to read all the other stuff. So then he says, verse 17, they refused to listen. They, oh, it wasn't that they couldn't do it or something was hindering them. They just didn't want to do it. So I said, I, I, I refuse to listen to you. And here's what the problem is. And did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. And so I told you before, when we stop reflecting and remember where God brought us from, we stop the rejoicing and the worshiping Him. So it's a very good idea to go back to the moment you got saved, often, and hang out there for a minute and say, where did God bring me from? So I still remember July 27, 1997. I still remember where God brought me from. I still remember how He saved my lost soul there with that Sunday night revival. Uh, I still remember where God has taken me to. And so it's good to sit down and remember sometimes. But when we, when we uh, don't remember, it causes us to wonder. So they, what, what wondrous deeds? Well, all the wondrous deeds he told us about last week. Uh, about how they, they were there in Egypt, and they were slaves, and they had no freedom whatsoever. And so what did God do? He said, let's get them out of here. And then he sent Moses along to perform ten different miracles, and there was plagues there. And then finally, uh, Pharaoh said, get them all out of here. And he even paid them to leave. But then he changed his mind and chased them down. They were trapped between a Red Sea and the Egyptian army. And he's a bunch of slaves and a bunch of little kids and all the animals there and all the senior adults. They had no way to fight this army off. And God just passed them through the Red Sea on dry ground. And you know how a miracle that is because you cannot walk where the water goes out in, in, in the uh, up beach without the uh, sand being wet. And yet it was completely dry. Not one, one person got hurt. Nobody fell down, twisted their ankle. Nothing happened to them. They all got across there. And then when the Egyptian army came across, God destroyed the entire army. Yes. And all this happened within a day. 
And so then they forgot about all those great miracles. We forget, hey, there was a time in my life when I didn't, didn't have no food to eat, but yet God somehow he brought some food to me. There was a time in my life when I needed a friend and God brought a friend to me. So we forget all the wonderful things that God has done for us. And he said that's the reason why they didn't, didn't really want to listen, listen to God, because they refused to listen and they did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. Look what he said in verse 18. Even when they made for themselves a, um, a calf of molten metal and said, this is your God who has brought you up from Egypt and committed great blasphemies. Wow. And so then uh, Moses up there hanging out with God, getting the Ten Commandments and his own brothers down there. Uh, he fell into the peer pressure. People say, hey, uh, we don't know where this Moses is. taking an awful long time to get down here. So let's go ahead and just make a golden calf and then say, this is what helped us. We need to have some kind of an idol to worship. And everybody's so worried about what, what Jesus looks like. And all their pictures are completely wrong. And so then it says they, uh, they made, made this golden calf. And then when Moses came down, he had some righteous anger when he found out what was going on down there. And, and God was fixing to strike them all down. And if they had, Moses had not intervened for them, uh, God probably would have struck them down that day and said, enough of this, I'll just start all over again. And get me a nation that, that wants to get serious. And, and then Aaron said, I don't know, man, we just threw all the stuff in there and it came out. It's a miracle. Playing the blame game, didn't work. So it says that they, they tried to make this golden calf. Hey, you ever hear that expression, holy cow? There's nothing holy about a cow. And the Hindus ought to figure that out. They're starving over there in India because they have a whole bunch of cows sitting around, but they won't eat them because they think it's their dead grandma just came back again. This false, ridiculous view of reincarnation. Hindus have 320 million gods that they worship. So it says that they had this cow that they came up with and, uh, and they said, this is what brought you up out of Egypt. So they said, what a great blasphemy. Instead of saying, God has blessed me. Right. Oh, this golden cow right here, this pagan idol we just made took us out of there. Uh, now look at verse 26. So they're still confessing all of their, their, their problems and how they messed up so many times. Verse 26, he goes, you talk about verse 25, that God's goodness. But then he said, verse 26, but they became disobedient. They rebelled against you, even after they blessed them again. They became disobedient and they rebelled against you and they cast your law behind their backs. Wow, what a statement. You know what that means? They cast their law behind their backs. They basically said, we don't care what God's word says. And they threw it behind their back as symbolic. And what they're saying is, we don't even want to look at our Bible and read what it says. We don't want to go down there where they might have a teacher or a preacher who might break open the Word of God and tell us what God says. We don't want that. Give us some more songs and some smoke shows and some fun so I can feel good about myself. And it says they turned around and they took God's Word and threw it behind their back. They said, don't, don't bring out what the Bible says. And it says, what do they do? When, when, the, when the prophets try to help them out, and say, hey, the Bible says this. It says, and killed your prophets who had admonished them so they might return to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Again, they committed great blasphemies. Wow. So what happened was God said, hey, you guys are in a mess. Let me send you somebody who's going to help you understand what my will is. And then let's just hope and pray that you'll get right with me and repent. And then I can bless your life. But he says oftentimes they would not do that. Now, thank God they did it in this, this time. Uh, they did it with Haggai because when Haggai and Zerubbabel and the others were, were trying to witness to them, they did get right with the Lord. They did build a temple. Uh, but Jesus said to the people in his day, he said, I've sent you so many prophets. Uh, and yet, what did you do? You killed them all. Uh, and you would not listen to them. You didn't listen to Isaiah. You didn't listen to Jeremiah. You wouldn't listen to nobody. And I sent all these prophets to you and tried to help you get right with me, but you didn't want to listen to any of them. And then he says, I'm, I'm here trying to help you all out, and, and yet you won't listen to me. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to send my disciples, and they're going to try to help you all out. You're not going to listen to any of them either. Wow. And so the same problem over and over and over again. So those who don't learn from the past, they're doomed to repeat the same failures, same mistakes. We've got the same problems today. And they say, ah, oh, you preachers of out daily, you're preaching too hard. Uh, you ought to just settle down. Don't take the Bible so little. So then it says, verse 27, 
So he, he said, I, I try to send you some prophets to help you all out, and you wouldn't listen to them. And uh, then you del then, uh, therefore that you deliver them into the hand of their oppressors who oppressed them. And so they said, we got what we deserved. And I told you, read the book of Judges, and you'll see how many times. And still over there today, they still will not repent and fall on their knees and acknowledge that Jesus is their Messiah. And I've been over there, and I've been down to the Western Wall. And you know what? The number one prayer they're praying for down there at the Wall is every single day, all day long, is they're praying for the temple to be rebuilt. Why do they want the temple to be rebuilt? Because they've got to make a sacrifice for their sins. They don't realize that Jesus is the Lamb of God who already took away the sins of the world. So instead of acknowledging Him, uh, they just want to get the temple, go back to the same old dead religion. So it says, they delivered them into the hand of their oppressors who oppressed them. Look at verse 29. And they admonished them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments but sinned against your ordinances. They said, I know what the Bible says. I just don't care and I'm going to do what I want to do. Wow. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck. And will not listen. You know, you know what the picture is? Stiff in their neck it means they refuse to bow. So remember this parable of the wheat and tares? And the wheat and the tares are growing up together. And, and the way that you can know the difference between the wheat and the tares, because the, the wheat, the, the, the word there in the Greek, it describes something that looks exactly like the, the, uh, the wheat and the tares. They look exactly the same. The tares was a weed. And then the wheat was very useful. And so then the only way you would know is when it got fully grown the wheat would bend over and the tear would stand straight up. And it's, it's symbolic of what the mindset. It means I refuse to bow before the Lord. It doesn't mean you have to physically bend your head you know, when you're praying or when you're singing or something like that. It just means it's your mindset, your heart. I'm going to bow before Almighty God. That's what we just sang about. I will bow before the lion and the lamb. Yeah. So I, I willingly do it. Nobody makes me do it. But listen now. One day... What we just sang right there? So you say, oh, I wasn't very familiar with that song. Well, you should have been because Paul talked about it, and he would have said amen to that song because he talked about it in Philippians uh, chapter 2, about how every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So everybody's going to do it. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter where they are. Well, I'll never do it. You will do it. Now listen, if you do it this side of, of your death, you'll have salvation. If you wait and say, I don't believe that stuff, I'm glad you guys believe it. Good for you. Glad you found religion. Uh, it's not for me. Then what's going to happen is you're going to die, and then your sin debt's not going to be paid, and then you're going to bow one day anyway. But it's for condemnation. So every knee means even Satan himself will bow and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. He's the boss. He's the, the master, the supreme authority. That's why we're just saying that he is the Lord Almighty. He is all-powerful, and nobody can stand in his way. Well, uh, the magnitude of the corruption, which describes much of what uh, we have to confess ourselves, was overshadowed, thankfully, by the magnificence of God's compassion. Thank God for the magnificence of God's compassion. Look at verse 19. So he told, them, told us uh, how they had really messed up, they wouldn't listen, they made golden calves and, and turned God's word through behind their back so they wouldn't have to listen to what God had to say. But then in verse 19 he says, you, and he's still talking to God, in your great compassion, thank God for his compassion. And the Bible says that they made new every morning. And why is that? Because I need him every morning. There's not a single second I don't need God's compassion and his mercy and his grace. He says, you in your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the pillar of fire by night uh, to light for them the way in which they were to go. Wow. So he says, uh, you should have abandoned them the way they acted towards you, but you are very gracious and very compassionate, and you wouldn't leave them out there. You wouldn't destroy them because Moses, he kind of pleaded with you. And he said, all right, I'll, I'll give him another chance. And, and then what happened was, he said, uh, during the daytime, he put a fire up there. He said, just, just follow the fire. Wherever you see the fire, follow me. Then, then the cloud during the, day, during the uh, daytime and the fire at night. And he said, just follow it around. I'll show you exactly where to go. And they just kept following it. Then he says, verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, can I just remind you that nobody can be saved without the Holy Spirit's influence. That's right. 
And, and so you can articulate the gospel as clearly as you want to. You can say, do you have any questions whatsoever? Not a one. What you said to me makes perfect sense. I understand exactly what you said. But if the Holy Spirit does not help them, they'll never get saved. Never, ever. They cannot get saved without the Holy Spirit's influence. Uh, nobody can understand spiritual truths without the Holy Spirit's influence. That's his very job to do that. So each one of the members of the Trinity have their own job. And that's his job. is to help us to understand spiritual truths and to convict us of our unrighteousness so we can get saved. And so I've got to get the Holy Spirit to help me out in getting saved. Then what happens is the moment I get saved and God says, now I'm going to put my Holy Spirit inside of you and he's going to seal you today of redemption. It's a guarantee that I will take you to heaven. And then if you listen to him, he will guide you through life and you won't mess up. So that's why Paul told me, hey, John, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. So every time I mess up, it's like, well, I didn't listen to God that time. So he said, you gave him your good spirit to instruct them. Now, they only have the spirit for a little while, for certain tasks. Thank God we have the Holy Spirit lives in us and stays in us. And John told us this morning in our life group that we are the temple of God. And God put his spirit in the temple. And so it says, your manna did not withhold from them their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. So he took of all their needs physically and spiritually. That's what God does for us. He takes care of our physical needs, takes care of our spiritual needs. He says, indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness and they did not, uh, and they were not in want. They had, they had no, no needs at all. They said, hey man, we're hungry. So God said, all right, go ahead and, and throw down some, some bread to them, some manna. Hey, we're thirsty, Moses. Okay, go ahead and hit that rock over there. Some water will come out in the desert, uh, and you'll get some water. Uh, now, by the way, when, when God causes the water to come down in the desert, blessings. Uh, you see what happened over in Dubai? Over there messing around, trying to play God themselves. Got some weird stuff going on with the clouds. And then what happened was they had uh, so much rain in one day. Yeah. Ten inches of rain. And I thought these, these videos I was seeing on Instagram were just like a joke or something. I said, what is this all about? And it showed all the floods. I showed John a video this morning. And then I saw it on the news. I said, okay, so this is real. And I said, this is really a, a thing here. And what it was, they were messing around the clouds over there. And they're trying to do something to, to get some rain so they can have uh, vegetation over there in the desert, over in Dubai. And so they messed around. They tried to play God. And God said, I'm going to give you so much rain, you're not going to do it at all. That's right. That's right. And the whole place was flooded. And all them fancy Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff they drive over there? Destroyed. Yeah. But he said, but when I give streams in the desert, it's good. And so he said, I'm, I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to take care of him. And then he says, look at there, in verse 22. Uh, verse, uh, well, verse 21, the second half of it, he says, Your clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet swell. Wouldn't you like to have that walking around for 40 years in the desert? And I said, you never had no problems with your feet. Your shoes, the sandals you had to wear, never wore out. Wouldn't you like to have a pair of shoes over the last 40 years? I got to go buy some shoes later on today. My sneakers are getting all worn out. And, and, and so it has not been 40 years. Them ladies, no shoe shopping. So the clothes, they didn't wear out either. No place to go, no coals around, no J.C. Penney, no other place to get, get, get some clothes. Then he said, verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted them as them a boundary. They took possession of the land of Sihon, the king of Heshbon. So he talks about all these different places they took, took possession of. And how they went into the promised land and God gave them this, this land that they did not earn or deserve. And so he says in verse 24, So their sons entered and possessed the land and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites. Uh, and you gave them into their hands with their kings and the peoples of the land to do with them as they desired. So he says, yeah, you don't deserve this promised land, but I, I promised you I would give it to you. And I kept my promise and I allowed you to go in there and defeat these other armies. And you did good as long as you listened to me. And in verse 25, they captured their fortified cities in a fertile land. They took possession of houses full of good, every, every good thing. Hewn cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and reveled in your great goodness. Because you, God, you gave them everything they needed physically. You gave them everything they needed spiritually. They needed a house, you gave them a house. You needed food, they gave them food. You needed clothes, you gave them clothes. You needed guidance, they gave them spiritual guidance. Gave them every single thing that they needed. Now, the overwhelming mystery 
uh, of God's love is that no matter how far we get from him, we are never beyond his reach. That is the great encouragement today that we can be like the prodigal son out there in the pig slop, wasted all the blessings that, that his father gave him, made an absolute disgrace of the family name, but got himself in a terrible mess. And yet if we'll get up, if we'll go back, just like the father in that story, the Lord Jesus Christ will come running to us. Amen. Can I remind you that the same great God in this Old Testament right here we're talking about is the same great God that we talk about in the New Testament? Is the same great God here today. Right. And what he did for them and what he did in the New Testament, he can do for us today. Right. And that is not a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. Some people have a misunderstanding. Like God in the Old Testament was mean and harsh and cruel and he would strike them down and beat them up. But then the God of the New Testament was nice and soft and sweet and gentle. He's always been holy right. and loving in the Old Testament holy and loving in the New Testament, holy and loving today. That's why he's the lion and the lamb. The lion speaks about his power, uh, his strength, his majesty. The lamb speaks about his humility and his love and his compassion. So he is both. He is the lion and the lamb. He is a holy God who despises all sin, hates all sin, will not tolerate any sin, but is also loving and gracious and kind and will forgive those who come to him. So God takes no pleasure in the death of his wicked. And sometimes we go to an extreme. Either we see God as being some mean old dictator up in the sky who just wants to zap everybody down, throw them all in hell, strike everybody down. Or we want to go to the other extreme, which is just as false. He just some sweet little old grandfather up in the sky saying, eh, they messed up. That's what happens. So we've got to make sure we understand who God really is. Holy, perfect, righteous, despises all sin. Very gracious, very kind, very loving, very compassionate. So he's not weak and soft on sin, and he's not some mean dictator just waiting to throw everybody in hell. And we go to one of the other extremes, we get ourselves in a mess. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. He's not up in heaven waiting for somebody to mess up so he can strike us down. Listen to how Jonah described God. Remember with Jonah? We looked at that in great detail. We went through that book. So here's what Jonah said about him. Jonah was tasked with the, with the, uh, the duty of going to Nineveh, a very wicked city, uh, a city who opposed the Jews. He didn't want to go. He tried to take off and go the other way. Ended up in a big mess, caused a problem for everybody else on the ship. Uh, he was down below, sound asleep, which reminds me I could be completely out of the will of God and still get a good night's rest. Somebody said, well, I sleep pretty good at night. That don't mean nothing. Jonah did. He slept real good. Uh, and he was completely out of the will of God. And in fact, the guy had to come down there. And remember the, the language we looked at in the Hebrew when it said that he had to kick him to wake him up? I and mean, he's like, he had to really work hard to get Jonah to wake up. It's like, good night. How could you sleep on a ship tossing all over the place in a storm with everybody screaming and hollering all around you? I couldn't sleep that way. And yet he was sound asleep. And then he finally uh, ended up in a fish's belly for three days. Uh, then only to save his own neck, he got out of there and said, God, God I'll, I'll go and do what you told me to do. So he went to Nineveh, did what God told him to do. Then a revival broke out, and everybody in town got saved. And he's the only preacher in the history of mankind that ever got mad because somebody got saved. <laughs> so he's outside the city now. And listen to what he says about God in Jonah 4.2. He prayed, Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord. Was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I didn't want to come here, God, because I knew you were going to do this. That's why I didn't want to come. Here's what he says about him. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Wow. Jonah said, God, I knew that you didn't just love the Jews, but you loved even these pagan Gentiles. And I knew if they repented and surrendered to you, you'd save them too. Yeah. And God, I didn't like them very much because they're not like me. And so I'm, I'm racist and I'm prejudiced and I hate them. And I wanted you to just throw them all in hell. And people that are not just like me, uh, don't save them. Only save people like me. And too many churches have that mindset. Well, if we get some people in here that don't look just like me, don't act like me, and talk like me, let them just sit over in the corner and be quiet. The gospel's for everybody. For everybody. 
And by the way, if you don't like everybody, you're going to have a hard time hanging out in heaven because John told me that he looked in there and he said, here's what I found out when I, got, when I looked up there. People from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. Wow. So when we're praying, when we touch every single seat and we pray over every seat here on Wednesday nights, and we're praying for God to bring in people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all personalities, everything. The people, they stood and they confessed that they deserve God's wrath, but instead he chose to give them mercy and grace. Wow. Listen to the song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean, John. The song, Mercy Came Running. It says, oh, once there was a holy place, evidence of God's embrace. I can almost see verse, mercy uh, face pressed against the veil. He, he's speaking about how before Jesus died on the cross, they would have to go into the Holy of Holies on the day of Yom Kippur. Only the high priest could do that to get into where the tabernacle was and, and, and the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in, inside the temple. And only on that one day could he go in there behind the veil and nobody else could go in there. And they had a tire rope around him in case he had sin in his life and he did not repent, he would be struck down dead there Then nobody else could go in there because they would have died too. So they had a rope there and they pulled him back out again. So what happened was there was mercy where God's presence was, was behind the veil. But then Jesus, what happened when he died on the cross? The veil tore in two from top to bottom. God tore it. And uh, he said, now I want to make a way for everybody to come to me. So now we can go in the very presence of God uh, not just one day a year, not just one person, anybody that has a relationship with Jesus can go in there. So it says, uh, he goes on to say, looking down with longing eyes, mercy must have realized that once his blood was sacrificed, freedom would prevail. So I'd be taken care of because I'm set free. And as the sky grew, grew dark, and it did for three hours, and the earth began to shake, there was an earthquake, and with justice no longer in the way. So, so now, see, there's a legal implication of Jesus dying on the cross. It's not just that Jesus said, hey, I love you now, and, and I'm going to be nice to you, and come on into heaven with me. No, he's still got to have the sin debt paid in full. Somebody's got to pay the bill. And so justice must be carried out. Otherwise, God himself is corrupt and sinful. He just says, well, they messed up. What can you do? That's what humans do. They just keep on messing up. He says, somebody's got to pay the sin debt in full. So he says, justice is now taken care of. So he says, mercy came running like a prisoner set free. Past all my failures to the point of my need. When the sin that I carried was all I could see and when I could not reach mercy, mercy came running to me. Thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ chased me down because I'd have never been looking for him. Listen to what Paul said about it in Romans 5.20. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So I was talking to a guy from Vietnam. Uh, he, he was in the Vietnam War. And, and he said, you don't realize, preacher, all the terrible things I did over there. I said, I have no idea. I was not over there uh, before my time. And, and I don't know what you all did over there. But I know one thing. No matter what you have done, no matter how guilty you feel about it, nothing that you could ever do would be stronger than the blood of Jesus. So he can forgive anybody of anything they have done if they will simply cry out to him and say, God, have mercy on me. No matter who they are. Uh, uh, anybody over there. Saddam Hussein could have been saved. Hitler could have been saved if he had just fallen on his knees and said, God, I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. So he said the sin, it was there and it was big, there's a lot, but grace, so much more. Wow. So we see the history and the hardness, but let's wrap it up, Lewis. What about them remembering their humbling by God? So God had to humble them. Look what he said there in verse 32. So he goes back and forth talking about how good God has been to them in so many different ways and how they kept on messing up in so many ways. And it says, now therefore, remember that word therefore, it says, what happened previously, what have I talked about because of all of that? Our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps a covenant and loving kindness. And by the way, you're never going to submit to God unless you acknowledge who he really is. He's a great, he's an awesome, he's a mighty God. Yes. We, we value ourselves too much and don't lift up Jesus enough. And he says, and he keeps covenant. And thank God that he does because I'm very unfaithful. Yes. But thank God that he is always faithful. He keeps the covenant. And loving kindness. Uh, do not let all this hardship seem insignificant. So now he's bringing it to his day as they're speaking. So he said, God, that's what our fathers did. But because of all of that, God, here's a situation we find ourselves in today. It says, this hardness, 
Remember now, they're, they're, they're still enslaved. Now, the pagan king allowed Nehemiah to go and rebuild the wall and even underwrite the whole project because they had no money. They're still slaves. And they said, well, we're, we're really we're suffering still, God, because of, we keep on messing up. And so now you got us in bondage to another king, Alexerxes. And then he says, uh, uh, do not let us seem insignificant before you, which has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, and our prophets, and our fathers, and all of, our, all of your people. From the days of the kings of Assyria to the day, uh, to this day. However, you are just in all that has come upon us. Notice what they said there. Uh, they said, God, we're in a mess still. We've been in a mess pretty much our whole history. And they can cry out today and say, God, we're in a mess right now with Iran trying to shoot rockets over here. Uh, we've got Gaza causing all kinds of problems. We've got problems coming all around us. And America seems to be bailing out on them. So, God, we're still in a mess. But God, you are just in all that you're doing to us. Wow. And he says, verse 32, However, you are just in all that has come upon us. You have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. God, you've been good to us, but we have not been so good to you. God, you've blessed us, but we have not responded the right kind of way. And I said, God, you've been so good to me, and yet I have taken it for granted uh, threw your law behind my back, so I don't care what God's word says, I'm going to do what I want to do. We bailed against you, did whatever I felt like doing, made excuses for it, and then I said, God, we're in a mess still. He says in verse 34, For our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law. God, nobody in this country is keeping your law. Wow. It doesn't mean that not one single person didn't listen to God, but he says, overall, as a nation, God, we have not listened to a word you said. And this has been our habit all of our life. He said, all paid attention to your commandments and your admonitions with which you have admonished them. But they in their own kingdom, with your great goodness which you gave them, with a broad and rich land which you set before them, did not serve you or turn from the evil deeds. God, even though you blessed us, you gave us the promised land, we had a wonderful home, and we, we got out of that Egypt and everything. Could you imagine them wanting to go back to Egypt? Could you imagine being a Christian and saying, well, I'll tell you what, this whole Christianity thing is a lot of work. I mean, just going to church every Sunday stuff. I mean, I don't know, reading my Bible every day and talking about Jesus all the time and, and, and giving and being generous and kind and loving and forgiving towards other people who are mean to me. That's ah, just too much work. I'm going to go back to the way I used to be. <laughs> sometimes you want to, but you've got to say, God, help me not to go back to that, that old mindset. And sometimes I'll say, uh, I act differently now because thanks to Calvary, I don't go back. Sometimes I want to go back there. I want to say, hey, uh, God, can I take a break from being a Christian just for a few minutes? I need to tell this person something. <laughs> <laughs> you ever start typing something? Then the Holy Spirit says, I do not approve of that. You go, boop, delete, okay. Oh, 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 something on Facebook, and you want to weigh in on it. You say, ah, I got a little feature called scrolling. I think I'll just scroll on by and mind my business. And sometimes you do good, and sometimes you don't do so good. So then he said in verse 36, Behold, we are slaves today. God, you've been good to us, but man, we sure I messed up, and now look at the mess we're in again. Now we're slaves again. As to the land which you gave to your fathers, that to eat and the fruit and bounty, we're slaves in it. We should be free. Should be having the prosperity we had in times past, but we've messed up again, and now we find ourselves in this terrible mess all over again. And they're in a mess again today. They may be free, but they're being bombarded from all angles. Right. And they're in a mess again today because they, they refuse to acknowledge who Jesus is. Yes. And they're still wrapped up in trying to get a temple built over there. And it will be built because the Bible says it will be built. Right. But it'll never get them into heaven. Never. It says, There's abundant produce for its kings, whom you have set over us because of our sins. God, you're just because of, we messed up. That's why we're in this mess right now. It's not because you're a mean God, you're unfaithful. You're a covenant-keeping God. You do what you say you're going to do, but the only problem is we keep on messing up. And because of our sins, we now find ourselves slaves to yet another nation. And we got the wall built, and we're glad about that. And we got the temple built, and we're glad about that. But we're still slaves to these people. Wow. And then notice the last line that he says there in verse 37. So we are in great distress. Wow. Listen to what David said about God's righteousness and justice when he punishes us for sinning against him. In Psalm 51, this is, this is David's repentant prayer. Because he'd been found out, he thought he got away with it. 
but then finally the Nathan the prophet came to him and said, hey, uh, God's let me in on some things, and, and, and I know what you did with Bathsheba. And I know all about what you did to her husband. I know all about it all. And God told me, and he wants me to confront you. So now in Psalm 51, he's crying out to God, and he's confessing his sins. And he had his own little confession time. Psalm 51, 4, against you, got David talking to God, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. God was evil that I did that. It wasn't an affair because he was too cute. It wasn't just some little slip up. It wasn't just a little mishap. It was evil that I did that. Yes. Well, it wasn't just my Irish temper coming out. It was evil that I did that. It wasn't just some little fib, little white lie. It was evil that I did that. It wasn't just some little website I shouldn't have been on that I went on. It was evil that I did that. They said, I did what was evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God, I deserved every bit I got. Wow. Now, I don't know if your father ever gave you any discipline or not. Uh, my father was old school. So I might have grown up in Boston, but he grew up on a, on a little tiny farm out in the middle of nowhere in Illinois. And he raised us with that mindset. And, and there were some times I said, hey, that wasn't me, that was my brother. And, and you blame me for something my brother did. He said, you probably did something I didn't catch you for. I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> and he didn't know about talking about feelings and timeouts and all that stuff. My dad had no concept of any of those things. And, and he was just when he punished us. I didn't like him, but he was just. Not so much probably anybody in this room, but maybe somebody online has got a speeding ticket. And they have to confess, the cop was just in giving a ticket. I was speeding. I, I did roll through that stop sign. Might not have wanted to pay the ticket. Might have wished he get, gave me a warning instead, but he was just in giving it to you. You deserved it. And so you have to confess, God, when you punish me, you are righteous and just to do it. You're fair. I deserve exactly what you did. I want the mercy and the grace, but sometimes, God, I need a little bit of that justice to remind me you're not soft on sin. You're not a weak old grandfather just sitting up in the clouds, looking down, saying, well, they just mess up. You're a serious God. And sin sent Jesus to the cross. And so the people there, they confess their sins. They say, we are in great distress. Now, how about you? Are you in great distress today? Would you say, my life is not really where it should be, and instead of me blaming all of my problems on everybody else, I need to blame myself. And say, it's my fault. It's not their fault. It's my fault. I didn't respond right. Oh, but they said this to me. They still could have responded differently. Uh, they ripped out Jesus' beard. They spit in his face. They mocked him. And yet he never said a harsh word towards any of them. He said, yeah, but he's God in the flesh. What about Stephen? They were stoning him to death. He was just a human like you and I. And yet, uh, as they were stoning him to death, uh, with rocks, okay? He wasn't uh, smoking a little marijuana. They were stoning him with rocks. You've got to be clear nowadays. And so he was getting stoned to death. And yet he said, God, have mercy on them. They don't know what they're doing. So we don't have to respond that way. We choose to, because of our pride. We say, they won't speak to me that way. I'll fix them. They'll find out who they're talking to real fast. No, well, they will. And it's good. You can do that. Uh, but you'll never honor the Lord that way, and you'll never receive God's blessings that way. So I'd rather uh, swallow my pride and receive God's blessings. And these people say, man, we did good sometimes. Other times, not so much. We find ourselves in this current day in a mess, God, because we didn't listen to you all those years. So we can blame it on our fathers and our grandfathers and everybody else, but they say, God, we're not doing so good today. And so we can blame it on the past and say, well, this and that. Uh, but we have to say, I got my own responsibility. The blame game didn't work for Adam and Eve, and it's going to work for you and I. We've got to take responsibility. Maybe today you need to come down and talk to God and confess some sins to Him. Maybe you need to come down here and say, God, I just want to praise you and thank you for how good you've been to me. You've been so good to me, and yet I have neglected to praise you and worship you for that. And I felt like because of my ingenuity, because of my hard work, that's why I'm, I'm where I am today. The business would not be successful if I didn't push it so hard. My social media skills, my connections and networking and all this stuff. If God doesn't bless it, I don't care what you do. You only get up out of your bed unless God allows you to. We've got to praise God today and say, God, thank you for being so good to me. And then pray and say, God, help me because I'm in a mess. And the nation is in a mess. And I've done very little to help the situation and pray. They're at home. God loves you. He died for you. He wants a personal relationship with you. Wherever you are around the world, he wants you to know that. And he can reach out to you and change your life right there where you are. 
Doesn't matter where you are in the world. You don't have to come down to a church building. You can do it right there in your house. You can repent of your sins. Surrender your life to Jesus. He will save you. He'll change your life forever. If you're already a born again Christian, He can fix any mess that's in your life. And He can do it today, right there where you are. And God wants you to know that. Let's all stand for prayer. The altar is going to be wide open. There's some very good altar calls here lately. And uh, the altar ought to be open in every single church every Sunday to give people an opportunity to respond to the Lord. Jesus gave invitations, we give invitations. Now, you don't have to come down and talk to me, you can just come down and talk to the Lord. Uh, and we promise you that if you come down to the altar, nobody's going to bug you. Uh, I know you're probably saying, well, I've been in one church one time and, and I went down there and the three guys asked me what I wanted and they made a big deal out of it. We're not going to do that. You want us to pray with you and for you, we'll do that. If you want to just talk to the Lord by yourself, you can come and do that as well. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, you're so good to us. We confess that we have messed up so many times. And yet, in your great mercy, in your grace, in your loving kindness, in your patience, you have tolerated us. And you've been good to us. And just as the Israelites confessed how good you were to them in spite of their rebellion, we have to confess the same today. So, Lord, like Isaiah, we are living in a sinful nation, and we are sinners ourselves. And we ask you to help us, cleanse us, and purify us from all the sin that's in our life, Lord. Help us to get real with you today and confess our sins by name to you. And we don't have to make a big deal and go on Facebook and tell everybody what we're doing. We don't have to explain anything to anybody else around us, but Lord, we need to talk to you. We pray you'd help us to do that. Lord, again, I beg you, if there's anybody in this room or hear my voice online that does not know your Son as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, I pray you save him today. Father, I pray you would change every heart and life that nobody would leave here the same way they walked in. Would you speak? Would you help us to obey? For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.